Hello, everybody, to the Wisdom Factory in nine, no, 2019. <laughs> we are starting again. We are trying again to start with our conversation with Lynn Fuentes on chronic illness as a path to spiritual growth and personal development. So today, we hope we can make it a little better. There were a lot of technical glitches. The original recording is still on the website, thewisdomfactory.net slash Lynn minus Fuentes. So you can see the first attempt there. We won't probably talk the same thing. So maybe it's interesting for you to watch the first attempt too. So I'm here today, first of all, with my new co-host, Martin Ocek. Hello, welcome everyone. <laughs> okay, you, you seem to be frozen, but uh, you will wake up hopefully. <laughs> yeah, it's very cold here, that's why I'm frozen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here too. Uh, you are in, in Istanbul, in Turkey. I'm in Italy and we have a strangely cool, cold winter this year. So, freezing mm. overnight, so not much, but a little cold <laughs> fire in the, in the, in the furnace. So now to you, Lynn Fuentes, thank you to, to be with us again and to have uh, be indulgent to our technical um, challenges and that we can do the session again. So I think for people who haven't watched the first part, it would be good if you introduce yourself again a little bit where you come from and what you are up to do <laughs> and what we are in this hour, what we will be talking about. Okay, thank you, Anyang. I'm happy to be here. And, you know, I think we've all been through endless technical difficulties, so no problem at all. Um, a little about myself. I uh, have a background in teaching, um, and I was a lawyer for a while and a journalist. I've had a number of different careers. Um, but I, during all that time, I've been involved with chronic illness in one way or another. My Son has been severely ill for 32 years now. So I've been a caregiver during that time. I've also had a lot of other family members who've had all kinds of illnesses, um, ranging from cancer to addictions to you name it. Um, so uh, when I was teaching, I was teaching at DePaul University in Chicago, and uh, I decided to start a program for students with chronic illness because their needs were very different from what the usual disability office was able to offer. Disability offer, uh, offices tend to help a student at the beginning of the term with access or with a reader or something like that. But chronic, people with chronic illness, everything waxes and wanes, very unpredictable. And it was very difficult for students to go to school and be understood and be helped in the way they needed to be. So I started that program in 2003 and um, managed it into 2010. Um, and as a result of that, I got to know a lot of other people with illness, a lot of students. And uh, so I learned a lot from them. And I've been on the boards of a couple of illness organizations, including the, what used to be the CFIS Association, uh, is now solved MECFS initiative. I was on that board for 11 years. Um, so I've had a lot of background there. I also taught courses in illness and I discovered integral, integral philosophy, which some of the listeners may know, in 1993. And that uh, turned my life around, both in terms of how I looked at illness, how I managed it, and um, how I, I brought it into everything I did into uh, the programs I was teaching and into the, the program for the students. So that's um, a little of my background, I guess. And uh, right now I have a company with my husband called Transformation Teaching and we offer online courses in both English and Spanish. Spanish is his native language. And uh, so we're doing a lot and we're putting on uh, with some other people, the first integral Hispano-American conference in June in Bogota. So that may interest oh. people who can speak Spanish. We'd love to have you come. Oh, wow, well, that would be great. <laughs> To go there. I don't speak Spanish, so but that's I great. speak Italian, so I might get at least half of it. <laughs> and I have very ragged Spanish. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. So anyway, 
Um, okay, so let's go into the chronic illness uh, topic. What do you understand about chronic illness? Last time we figured out is diabetes or what, what sort of chronic illness as you are talking about? Which can... Well, I talk about a really broad range and I include addiction and I include mental illness in my definition of chronic illness. It's really an illness that interferes substantially with your life. I'm not talking about hay fever, which I have. Uh, we're talking about something that makes life different, uh, where people have to really uh, adjust themselves and it, it comes into their life and turns up everything upside down. So um, it depends on the severity. Many of these illnesses have varying degrees of difficulty. Some people with diabetes function almost um, like everybody else, and other people have significant issues. And the same is true of you know, many of the autoimmune illnesses. They have a wide spectrum. So I tend to find the people that, that I work with mostly and that come to me are, are people with pretty severe illnesses. They've been often sick for a long time. Um, they tend to be, I, I learn a lot from, from people in this situation. They tend to be very wise, very experienced. They have worked through so much, so many difficulties, and they have a lot, lot to offer, um, which is one of the things I really want to bring out is, is how much people with illness have to offer and, and how our society often doesn't see that. This so is I think interesting. that's how I define it. Talk a little more about that. What do they have to offer? Well, I think um, when we talk about human growth and development, uh, usually it comes out of what can be called disorienting dilemmas. People get to a certain place in their life and whatever's going on is somehow not satisfying. They can't figure out their problems. They're stuck in some way. And in order to move on, they, they find new ways to look at something. That's really what changes. The situation may not change, but the person changes. They have a new way of understanding what's going on. And a result of that, a lot of different options will open up. A lot of clarity might appear. So people who live a normal life can distract themselves from these dilemmas. So you don't have such a good job while you increase your social life or um, you know, various things are happening. You get a divorce, and, uh, but you pour yourself into your work or you know, whatever it is. But if you're ill, you can't get away from the illness. There's no way to say, I'm not going to look at you today. I'm going to go out and play tennis because you just can't do that. So I find that people with illness actually have to face these dilemmas head on and over and over again. They're relentless. They're never ending. And so there's a continuous process of growth that goes on when you actually take on some of these, these questions, which can go deeper and deeper. You can start out with a very simple, practical problem. How do I manage this illness? and go very deeply into what does this illness mean for me? Um, how do I make a meaningful life with this illness? Into even deeply spiritual questions like why is there suffering? Um, and and uh, what does a world with suffering look like? And how does that work with my, my spirituality? So each, each, people who are ill often have to deal with these questions. And I find that the answers are really pretty amazing. And another thing um, about this is that I think I mentioned last time that 50% of people in the United States have a, a serious chronic illness. And they're not all end of life, obviously a lot of them are, but there are many, many people between the ages of 18 and 45 who are seriously ill and they're trying to manage a life. They're trying to have a job. They're trying to have a family. Um, they're trying to have a social life and they have a serious illness interfering with it. And what we do is we ignore it. As a society, we tend to think, oh, well, they'll just get better soon. Or if they don't, they get relegated to some backwater. Um, not only in the minds of society, but in their own minds. I think people who get ill are subject to all of these cultural beliefs and they see themselves as, as somehow sidelined. They're not on the track to success or whatever. Um, and one of the things I, I really believe is there is no one track for life. There, there are many paths for life and there's nothing that says you have to be in the, what we have now a pretty traditional model of go to school, get a good job, make a lot of money uh, so you can retire and <clears throat> you know, th then you're successful. 
And I don't think that's the only way to be successful. And I think that people who are ill are on another life path and it's an equally valid life path and it has its own serious challenges and its own successes. So that's something that I, I feel very strongly as a result of the, the experiences that I've had and the work I've done with people. The defi definition of what is success you know, is also uh, <laughs> not clear because we in our society that seems when we talk in let's say integral terms and levels of development very orange. You know? Success yes. means a lot of money and um, I mean, it's success that we are still alive in many ways, isn't it? I think so. I think, well, you can say, what is the purpose for life? Now, there's another really, really deep question. Is it to go out and be successful and productive and make a lot of money? I think life is just a whole lot bigger than that. Um, and just living, um, you know, why are we here? I don't know. Maybe one of the reasons we're here is just to experience. Maybe our little set of receptors, my eyes, my ears, my understanding is feeding the whole. And so maybe I really don't have to do anything so much as I have to receive. And uh, in illness, you can receive. There's nothing that says that you're any, any less able. In fact, sometimes your senses are more acute because you have to be paying attention to so many things. So yeah, the definition of success. Yes, in integral terms, the orange driving achieving is another one. Um, that that if we all seem to buy into it. I mean, at least a lot of people buy into, and those are the messages that you get. So you could feel like you're a failure if you're ill or you're, for some other reason, not on that track. I remember when um, I had small children, and a, a woman I knew also had small children, and we'd go to a party, and it would be like nobody wanted to talk to you because you weren't doing anything meaningful. <laughs> So she, she used to make up a story that she did blue movies uh, so she would get some attention. And I think, you know, that's changed a little bit over time, but not a lot. There are certain people who seem to have prestige and others who do not. And, and uh, money and status seem to be still on top for that. And I'd like to see that change. Mm -hmm. so, so what would you say are... are other success goals or when you said, you know, people with chronic illness, they, they are successful in different ways. Yes. Well, I think, um, first of all, do we, do we set goals? That's a, you use that word and that's a really interesting question because uh, if so, I think very different ones. Maybe it's more about who we are than what we do. And I think mm -hmm. that's being neglected so that I think, you know, I can decide to be an honest person. I can decide to be a compassionate person in whatever circumstances I'm in. And, and if that's my goal, that's achievable regardless of the circumstances. Um, so I don't have to produce to be successful. I think mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, for me, I'm more interested in, in who the person is than, than in what they have done in most cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, if you look at a life, most of what we do just turns to dust after we're gone. Um, but if we have been kind to other people or we have had uh, some capacity for wisdom and helped others, I think that trickles more out into the world and has more effect in a way. Mm -hmm. So it just happened more or less by coincidence that I, I saw a movie last night. It's called Don't Worry. He won't get far on foot. I don't know if you've seen that movie. It came out last year. And it's, have you seen the movie? No, I haven't. It, it just made me think, it's the story of someone who was in a, you know, an alcoholic and drunk in a car accident and got paralyzed from chest down. Mm. And, and, you know, he saw all this suffering and then he became a somewhat famous cartoonist and became sober and then went to the whole 12-step program. So it was kind of, you know, it, obviously he was chronically uh, handicapped, I would say, maybe not ill, but handicapped. Yeah. And, but it also, you know, people make movies about people like that, like they make movies about Steve Jobs or other successful people who kind of pulled through something and of course, there are very, very few movies made about the people who never became a famous cartoonist in a wheelchair or, or otherwise succeed. So how, how do 
how do people with chronic illnesses feel about that when you know when they're fed sort of like the stories of the one percent who who despite their chronic illness became somewhat famous and rich and made a made an orange success story out of it yeah I, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword i think it's wonderful that the we are highlighting these stories and not all stories of people who uh, achieve in the ordinary way, but people who have overcome great handicaps. Mm -hmm. But there's also, I think, a problem in that I call it the heroically disabled. When we are faced with that, the other people, the other 99% who actually can't do what this person can do, start yeah. to think, well, why shouldn't I? Or their friends and relatives, well, so and so wrote a book, and you know, this man in a wheelchair managed to get to the top of Pike's Peak, and so, you know, what's the matter with you? And, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think it can be turned into kind of a punishing thing, uh, even though the intention I think was great to highlight mm -hmm. people and to, to show what they can do. Uh, not everybody can. And I think we need to highlight those ordinary lives where for a person just getting a shower can be like climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. It can mm -hmm. take an incredible amount of effort. And, yeah. and they have, no less um, productivity in a way. It's just that, that the energy level or the capacity is just so greatly reduced. But the mm -hmm. person themselves is equally heroic. Yeah. Uh, so. And if I may butt in with another question, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you haven't mentioned cancer, I think, and I have a friend who is, so like has an incurable cancer as it seems. Is that seen as a chronic illness? Because, of course, some people go into remission and, and, and get healed, and other people are hanging in there, and other people are clearly you know, incurable. How, can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, I think cancer has, in a way, become a chronic illness because of all the treatments that people are, you know, don't die, but often they have conditions. Sometimes the treatments themselves can leave them with difficulty. I know a lot of people with... Um, chronic fatigue syndrome can acquire it as a result of sometimes treatment from another illness and it sets something off in the body. So yeah, cancer, I mean, an illness that's like a broken bone or um, I had a cancer when I was in my 20s, but it was cured very rapidly and never caused me any new problems. And, and so I, I didn't regard that as a, a chronic illness that I have, mm -hmm. but a lot mm -hmm. of people with, with cancer are continuing to feel the effects in one way or another. And even if they're in remission, they're living with the question, will it come back? They're probably doing their best to lower their stress levels and eat well and do all those kinds of things that, that a person whose illness is active would do in order to prevent it. So their lives have changed too. I mean, I, 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 the, these lines are very fuzzy, you know, where we actually draw them. And I think a lot of it is self-definition. And I know there, there's a wonderful book out um, called In the Kingdom of the Sick by Lori Edwards, which is a sociological discussion of illness in America. And she tries to draw some of these lines between disabled and chronically ill and disease. And um, all of these different words have different meaning. And one of the really odd things that came out was that people who have a chronic illness do not regard themselves usually as disabled. So I discovered this when I was teaching in part, and I've seen it play out in other ways, in that the students didn't come to the disability office, even though they were in a way disabled from living a normal life because disability to their mind meant maybe a wheelchair or hearing difficulty or sight difficulty. Mm -hmm. So all of these different definitions make a difference. They make a difference to how people see themselves and how others see them and what kind of services they get, uh, where mm -hmm. they go. So it's a really interesting sociological question. So for myself, I don't draw very firm lines. I think mm -hmm. if people self-select into my courses or um, into the, the mm -hmm. program that I had or whatever, then that's fine. You know, their own definition mm -hmm. is, is is what counts. But have you noticed that people have changed the definition of what their ailment is through, through thinking more about these different terms? I find it very fascinating because I never thought about it that way. Yeah, um, I think... Disabled and disease and what you just mentioned is different. 
Yeah, I have a friend, her, her name is Pat Fennell, and she, she um, is a researcher into chronic illness, and also um, she's written a book called The Chronic Illness Workbook. But she has a, a four-stage model of what people go through when they get sick. And the first is the crisis stage. Um, illness is actually a trauma all by itself. When you get an illness, that itself is a trauma, and there you are in crisis trying to deal with it. And then the next phase is, and I hope I get these right, stabilization. That's where you begin to accept the fact that you have an illness and work to try to get yourself stable because many illnesses are very destabilizing. You can feel better one day and not so much the other day. Some foods affect you, some don't. Um, weather can cause things. So it can be a very, very destabilizing kind of experience. And often people go into what's called a push and crash model where they start to feel a little better and they run out. My son did this. He would feel a little better. He'd sign up for guitar, the track team, and you know, take on extra courses. And then three weeks later, be back in bed. So this mm -hmm. is a, uh, something that people, you know, it goes along with in a way denying the illness. I'm not really ill. I don't want to be ill. I refuse to be ill. So trying mm -hmm. to live a normal life. And then, and then going back into a phase call of acceptance. Okay, this is my life. I now have a new life. And I have to figure out how to make that life work. Mm -hmm. So at that stage, people are seeing themselves differently and their illness differently. And then her fourth stage is transcendence, when you can move beyond in a really in a spiritual sense, move beyond the illness. Mm. So I like, I like I that want, one. Yeah, I want to come in here because we did uh, the series, Conscious Living, Conscious Dying. And uh, I interviewed a um, German person, Harald Kastner, who had... Um, serious illness, an autoimmune disease. I mean, he still has it, but it was in 96, he was diagnosed for other three years of life, you know, and I mean, he's still alive. And when we talked, people can find that on the website under uh, the bonus uh, calls in the Conscious Living, Conscious Dies, Dying series. Uh, he said he refuses to call himself ill. Hmm. He, says he is a healthy pe person with some restrictions. Yeah. And he explains hmm. uh, how the same, what you said, the first uh, year he was very much in sports and he couldn't do that all anymore. And then he used himself as a research object, how he could go on. And he didn't do only normal medicine, but tried all, all alternative medicine all together. And he figured out how to survive more than 20 years. And mm -hmm. sometimes he has some burst times and sometimes completely seems normal. So it is amazing how people can uh, navigate these situations. And I'm really in big admiration of, because I, Normally, I have now a little bit of, you know, a cold and uh, already get impatient. <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. So Casey, how a little thing can just throw us off and then we look at people with these, these massively difficult problems. And I think mm. that's a really interesting point to bring up about integral again, is that, that using integral philosophy, uh, which I try to make very accessible, can help us to work in many areas of our life and we can we can um, improve things slowly and, and in each area of life. And so that gradually we can bring them together. We integrate um, our, our care for ourselves and, and we, we deal with our emotions, we deal with our physical self, we deal with a lot of different things, our environment. Um, and that, that can, that's one of the things I try to do in the courses is we use these models to try to look into as many corners as possible as to how we can look at illness and how we can improve things. So, yes. Yeah, would you like to explain a little bit how you see illness from the integral perspective? And Yeah, yeah, actually, I, I, I'd love to do that. <laughs> I love integral, so I, I'd like to get a chance. So um, we use uh, several models. One model that, that is very, very helpful in illness is called the four quadrant model. And um, this model shows how there are basically four ways we can look at life um, and, and we can look at illness. So taking illness as an example, we can see that our physical body 
has got something going on with it. Um, it's not working the way we want it to. So objectively, there's something here to see. And we go to the doctor and we get tests and we can take our temperature and our blood pressure and do blood tests and get data back. And this is all an objective look at what's going on. Um, but at the same time that that's going on, the person is feeling things. They're feeling fear. They're, they're feeling um, upset. They're feeling frustrated. They're, they have a lot of things going on with them. They're worrying about, can I keep my job? What's gonna happen to my marriage? Am I the person I used to be? These are all these interior things going on with a person. So we have uh, the interior of ourselves and we have the exterior of ourselves. So those are the upper left and the upper right quadrants of this model. And then we also have this going on as a society. So we have the collective side, that's the individual side, my interior and my objective exterior. But we also have the exterior of the world, which is the systems we're in. We've, we have to now deal with a medical system. We have to deal with an insurance system. Our employment, uh, the system we work there, that's going to be affected. Even transportation is going to affect us. Can we actually get to the, to the treatment that we need and things like that? Um, and then there's the interior of the collective, which is the, the norms of society. So wherever we are, we live in a culture and it has certain views about illness. Those are going to affect us. We're going to see television ads about illness that, that you know, paint everybody as the Pepsi generation. And if you just take this medication, you'll out be out throwing a Frisbee to your dog. Um, and yet the person is nowhere near that. They, <laughs> And they're very ill. So they get these messages and they have relationships, this inner relationship with their family, their friends, their employers. So all those are the interior sides of our social lives. And so when we look at illness, if we look at only one part of it, we go to the doctor and all they're interested in is the tests. And they say, well, the tests don't show anything here. But the person knows they're sick. They know there's something wrong with them. Now we've got a disjunct between these, these quadrants. Or maybe you want to take a certain treatment, but your insurance won't pay for it. So now you're dealing with the, the insurance system. And, and even though maybe there's something that help, would help, you can't use it. So you've got to deal with that area. And then you go home to your family and you come up with maybe you want to try alternative medicine and they're all horrified. So now you've got a battle going on in the interior cultural world. So each one of these quadrants is really important. So we try to take on this and look at what's going on inside me, what's going on objectively in my world, what's going on in my relationships, and what's going on in my relationship with the various systems that I live in. Mm -hmm. And if you can improve any one of these, it's synergistic, it, it can help improve the others. I mean, if your family situation is better, you can relax a little more. Maybe you can have a better conversation with your doctor. Maybe, you know, you can change doctors. There are various things you can do to try to see this, this illness in a much bigger perspective. And then there are other models. There's a, a spiritual aspect to, to integral theory in which you can see yourself as larger than all of this. You are more than your illness. You are more than you're showing up just in this world as this small person. And if you can get in touch with some of that and with some of the, the depth and the wisdom and the compassion that we can learn from illness, then you can, you can find yourself in a different place and you can see illness differently. So that's another, another aspect of integral theory. And then integral theory also has a model of personal growth. Um, so most of us, particularly people who'd be listening to this, you, through this uh, broadcast would be really interested in growing themselves. They, there's a certain stage of development at which we begin to say, who am I? What is this about? Who do I want to be? What's my psychology? How do I understand this world? All those kinds of questions. And we learn to grow and develop. We move from um, over the course of our lifetime, if we're lucky, <laughs> we grow. We move from a really egocentric, self-centered world, not necessarily a nasty one. Not everybody goes through as a horrible person, but they go through as a kind of a self-centered person. Think of yourself as a teenager. Did you really care you know, how your parents were feeling that day or were you more interested in getting the car keys? Um, so you start out with that kind of self-centered look and then you move into a, 
a broader look, um, one in which you begin to, to care about other people, other people in your community, other people in your nation. But usually for a while it's pretty limited. Um, you get connection to some people, but the other people don't seem to be as connected to you. So this group is good and that group not so good. So there's a lot of in-group, out-group kind of thing. But there isn't a capacity to work with groups and to live within certain norms and rules and be cooperative and raise a family, and get a job and all those kinds of things. And then if you're lucky, you develop beyond that. You start to, first of all, see yourself as an individual, not just, you know, follow group think. You start thinking for yourself. So in illness, it's like, okay, well, the doctor says this and my mother says this and but what do I really think? And how do I find out what to do about illness? So then you might start researching. You might actually look around and try to bring in some articles to your doctor and ask about new treatments and seek out people who are experts in the field and that kind of thing. Um, and that's a level of growth. And, and each of these expands the person. The person has more options every time they grow. And a stage beyond that is to um, understand the context in which all this is taking place. You can see the, the effect of society on people and the kinds of illnesses that develop and the effect of the mind on the body and the body on the mind. And so as you can see, this continues. Um, over our lifetime, we can go more and more and more deeply into these questions. Mm -hmm. And so we use this growth model and talk about ways that we can grow ourselves and increase our options and increase our understanding of ourselves, get more mature. I mean, maturity helps in illness. If a teenager's sick, they're going to be really pretty difficult to handle. But an older person who has some realism, some capacity for self-control and things like that, they're going to manage their illness just a lot better. So moving away from these more impulsive places and into more recent ones also helps a great deal in illness. So that's just a few of the models, um, but they, I find them enormously helpful in just broadening our, our gaze as we look at illness. Yeah, this is fine. And mainly you spoke now of the personal development, but you say that's also spiritual development. How do you mean that? Well, I think, um, if you look at any of the spiritual literature, and I don't regard myself as an expert <laughs> on this, um, you can see that, that the development of wisdom and compassion seem to be paramount. Um, this is a, a kind of spiritual intelligence. Cindy Wigglesworth has written a book about this. There's a there's kind of spiritual intelligence we can develop. And in many ways, we can become a calm and healing presence. So we can develop our presence. We can develop our awareness. Uh, the witness is the, um, the awareness of, of being. Um, and, and in the witness, we don't judge, we don't um, have any, any um, sense of, is this good or is this bad? We sit and watch. And to the extent that a person can come into this witness state, they have a different view of illness. Uh, Ken Wilber uses the term, hurts more but bothers you less. So it's not that you cease to feel pain and it's not that you don't care, but you can see it all from a, a distant place, from a more, from a larger place. And, and as a result of that, you can develop a great deal of calm and peace in your life. Um, <clears throat> there are other um, issues of spirituality about letting go, for example. And illness is a great teacher of letting go because when you can't do something and you keep trying, you can't cure yourself and you keep trying a new thing and a new thing. Eventually, there's a kind of letting go that happens. It doesn't mean you give up. It doesn't mean you stop trying to cure yourself, but you let go inside that, that knot of tension can release itself. And there are many other spiritual practices. I mean, meditation is, is a practice that has been shown to develop people's personal growth as well as spiritual growth. Um, because meditation teaches you to make object what was subject. And what I mean by that is, is you can look at a two-year-old and when they're angry and screaming, they are anger. When they get to be seven or eight, they can talk to you and say, oh, I'm angry today. I have anger today. So anger becomes an object. It's something they have. They have a little bit of control over it. 
And we can do the same thing with a lot of other things. You, you know, I, I have a body. I am not my body. So I'm not drowning in this sick body. I'm a, I'm, I'm a person who is larger than this body. I have a body and I have to take care of it. And yes, it's got some problems, but I'm bigger. Um, and, and then you can go beyond that to, be, to go beyond your thoughts. You are not your thoughts. So even though you have these worries and threat and you know, internal rumination, you're, you're more than that. So this constant expansion of, of being um, is another aspect of spirituality. So there are many, many spiritual questions that I think illness just highlights. Again, the issue of why is there suffering? And that, that comes to the name of my course, which is the koan of illness, because illness presents koans. Koans are, are unsolvable puzzles, spiritual puzzles. They're given to aspirants in a spiritual tradition uh, to help them expand their minds, not to answer the question, because there is no logical, practical answer to the question. And the illness is like that. But they're questions that you hold close to yourself. And as you do that, things are revealed to you. You, you see differently. You see different things. So the question may not be answered in a logical, practical way, but it grows you just to, just to hold that question. So I hope that's... So my dear. Martin, would you like to say I muted you because there was a tickle, tickle, tickle of noise, but it was not on your side. So if you want to ask something, you must unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah. There we go. I'm back. Yeah, there I, you are. I, don't, I don't think the tickle sound. Nothing was tickling me. <laughs> <laughs> it might be the sound of the pneumatic drill here that I can hear. Yeah. I think it has something to do with your microphone here that it's uh, sometimes like, well, it's not, it's not a, a problem. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah, I, I actually want to uh, ask Lina a question you asked last time, which I found very fascinating and, and which also hit home with me about these new age thoughts of people bringing on illnesses basically to, to, to their own thoughts and, uh, and yeah, then I, uh, yeah. I wove that in then with with this upper right upper upper left question sharing that I in 1988 started to have really severe panic attacks which were because of stress and I had met my which who became then my second wife and was in love but didn't couldn't see her during the week and there was just a lot of stress in my life but ultimately I mean I realized that my brain had brought on all these physical symptoms and through meditation and other techniques, you know, I got over them. So, so on one side, there is, for me, at least a certain truth that sometimes our mind can make us ill. On the other side, somebody asked, my, asked me why my daughter attracted a benign cancer when she was nine, right? And why she created it with her mind, which really you know, pissed me off and obviously wasn't that she was thinking about getting cancer. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a huge question today and it shows up in, in all kinds of areas. It shows up in the battle between convention and al conventional and alternative medicine and the way that people speak about it. And I, yes, yeah, I think it is a quadrant problem. And I think if you can't see the four quadrants, you can't, you're going to lump everything together. The traditional problem has been in conventional medicine that everything is a physical and you, you know forget those stupid support groups and don't bother you know meditation is useless and all that kind of thing and that's a quadrant reductionism that's reducing everything to this one objective behavioral quadrant so along came the alternative medicine movement and the new thought movement and we moved to the other side we moved to the interior where we said wait a minute our thoughts our beliefs Everything affects our body, and that's true. But they also became guilty of, in my opinion, quadrant reductionism, reducing everything to this quadrant. So I think we have to be very careful not to do that. It seems popular. People seem to love to believe that we create our own reality. But as Ken Wilber says, we don't create our reality. We create our experience of reality. And if we see it in that sense, yes, I can work with my thoughts and my beliefs, and I will see something very differently. My life will be less stressful. I will be happier, 
and that will affect my body. So whatever it is I have going on, there'll be more energy freed up to fight whatever disease I have. Um, it'll, if it's a stress-induced disease, yes, I might actually cure it that way. But if we look at a, an, an illness that comes about not, not clearly through um, our thoughts and our beliefs, and I know people will argue about this, but I honestly believe that sometimes, as a, I saw a little poster, a tumor is just a tumor. We don't have to turn it into a meaning. We don't have to say you have too much anger at your father. We don't have to say you're not spiritual enough. Because those things are actually, to me, a form of cruelty. When people dump that on someone who is ill, it is really an unkind thing to do. Because obviously they know, they know all this stuff about thoughts and belief, and they're probably beating themselves up inside thinking, I caused this, what can I do? Mm. And often it's just not true. They, something happened. For us to think we cause everything, to me, is a very deep form of egocentrism. There are, there's an enormous world. There are 7 billion people in this world. Do I control the other person's um, horrible Ebola who's sitting next to me and gives it to me? Uh, now, you, you could go back and say, I wouldn't be in Africa if I didn't, blah, 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 and you can trace it back. But basically, no, I got something I didn't ask for. I didn't mm -hmm. want. It has affected me. The only question I have now is how do I relate to this? Mm -hmm. And that I can use my upper left. I can use my interior. Okay, do I see this as a tragedy? Do I see this as an opportunity? Um, do I see this as a way to change my lifestyle? Yes, that can all be true. And that can be really helpful. But I think we have to be very careful to look at where did this problem originate? Because some problems originate in the body. Some problems originate in the mind. The body affects the mind. You find many people who have serious illnesses get depression and anxiety. Not because they had depression and anxiety, because the very situation that they find themselves in produces depression and anxiety. Hmm. Also, the body, the chemicals in the body, can produce all kinds of mental effects. So you'll find people who, who can have hallucinations from medication, who people who can have depression from not getting the right kind of nutrients in the body. Mm -hmm. You can find all kinds of things like that. And so to lump everything under the heading of beliefs and thoughts, and um, I just, I'm very, actually really kind of opposed to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also you can get, you, the, the culture can lead to illness. The context in which we live, and somebody who lives next to a factory spewing pollution, they're going to be affected culturally. It's not their own thoughts and beliefs. It's not even their own body. It's the exterior. And then yeah. the same thing with the systems, the atrogenic illness. So, you know, somebody goes into the hospital and they get um, injured in some way or they pick up another kind of illness. My mother died of a MRSA infection she contracted in the hospital. So illness comes from many different directions and it's solved in many different directions. So Sometimes, yes, we have to take medicine. Sometimes, yes, we have to do various treatments. Sometimes we need to work on our family relationships, and sometimes we need to work on our mm. interior self. Yeah. The more the better, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I find that very, very good example how to use integral theory, the four quadrants, to get these all things together, you know? Because when we look for the reason, it's really just one reason. We, as humans, we want to know exactly one you know, answer to our questions. And we are, have such a hard time to, to allow that there might be several uh, reasons. And they may all be true, what Ken Wilber says, true but partial, you yes. know? <laughs> so. Yes, that's such a wonderful phrase. I love that phrase. Yes, true, but partial. It's not mm -hmm. the whole story. And you're yeah. right, everybody wants that silver bu bullet. They want that answer. If you're sick, by gosh, I mean, the the industry makes an enormous amount of money out of sick people who are trying endless treatments to make themselves well. And, and they're, they're all, well, I'd be desperate too. Anybody's desperate whose life is being upended to try to find an answer. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but looking more broadly is usually more successful. Yeah. Wonderful. That was a good example how useful integral theory can be in everyday life for, for mm -hmm. everybody. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Ever since and I it, discovered it, it's made such a difference in, in my own life. I mean, I've, um, 
I've, it's completely changed the way I see things. And, mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I think everybody who is ready to understand it has this experience. As far as I know people from the integral community, everybody said, as soon as I got it, I changed everything, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And nothing really has come that, that you know, would go really in that way beyond, at least in my experience. That's also no. fascinating no. how comprehensive the model is. Last yeah, time there's no offered, end. Yeah. yeah, there's no end to learning about it. I, I, yeah. Every day I, I find another way that I can mm. go more deeply. Yeah. So last time we had also talked a little bit more about the lower right quadrant, about minorities and, and socially underprivileged people not having access to nutrition and things like that, not because of, of their own choice, but just of the environment they're living in, right? Which can also lead to more illness and more chronic illness and things like that. Yes, that's exactly yeah. right. Um, yeah, yeah this, there are systems our political system and our, I mean, a political system, for example, can change overnight who is, who gets access to medical treatment. So yeah, that's yeah. very important. The economic system, the, how, you know, who gets paid what, that's another big issue yeah. to how people do it or where they can live. As you point out, if all you have in your neighborhood is a convenience store, your diet yeah. is just not going to be as healthy as somebody yeah. who has access to all kinds of organic foods and things like that. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And your social status, that will affect you. Go into a doctor and you often hear people say, you know, as soon as I became a patient, my social status dropped. Uh, mm -hmm. I was reading a book by a, a physician who said the same thing. Actually, when I was a physician, I, everybody, you know, sir, and, and, and listened to me and everything. And then I became the patient and I saw how how you know people wanted to pat me on the head and tell me what to do and yeah. um, or pity or or a lot of things. So yeah, yeah, the system affects us a great deal. Mm -hmm. So I have another it, question that arose from me. The other side of the system, you know, when you have changed the position before, you don't understand it. No, no you don't. Excuse me, Martin. You had a lag, so now I give the time to you. Yeah. So. What about people who have a chronic illness and are, you know, they're aware that they have it, but they, they start to push other people away and become somewhat cynical about society? Like, so like, you know, all people are crazy. I hate all people and, and they're so unconscious and, you know, not really seeing that they're also to a large extent projecting that on society based on their chronic illness and are not blaming society for their chronic illness, but blaming society in general then for being very insensitive, very unconscious, very, you know, well, I, turning I think, away from life in a way. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, I want to first say that there can be very good reasons for that. Um, there are people, illness makes people hypersensitive. You can be like a raw nerve. Everything around you can feel like a disc attack when you're sick. Mm. I mean, just think when I have the flu, it's just like, oh, go away. No, no, don't, mm. I don't want to talk about this. And <coughs> if you've got a, a, an illness that leaves you in that state every day, interaction is going to be extremely difficult. The world is going to seem very harsh. Mm. So I want to say that just physically, I think we have to allow people to do that and i am and and to to we have to acknowledge the fact that the world is difficult for them mm -hmm. um another way <clears throat> another way that we can can see this is is that um you know i'm forgetting where i was going to go with this but um <clears throat> yes there is the pushing away of others oh i know what i was going to say I have an ebook uh, which you can get on my website called the uh, the Koan of Illness Guide or something, and I I go through Elizabeth Kubler Ross's five stages um, and apply them to chronic illness. And mm -hmm. so the second stage there is anger, mm -hmm. um, and people get angry. They're angry at their body. They're angry at themselves, but they do also they're angry at, at everything. And so I think that that can be a part of their makeup and a and a, and a way of of being where, yes, you do want to project all that pain out on the society. So it can have a, a psychological thing. And there, I think it can help to have therapy to deal with, with that aspect where, you know, you're dealing with this deep anger 
um, at everything. And very justifiably, you know, you can see, I would, you know, who wouldn't be angry at being pushed aside and losing their job and maybe having their spouse leave them and um, not being able to be taken seriously. Yeah, there are a lot of reasons to be angry. Um, but then the resentment can build up and that can create more health problems. So I think dealing with that is, is really important. But I think we also have to realize that often people push some away because they have to push someone away. They just mm -hmm. can't, they can't actually function in the way mm -hmm. that they used to. But, but if we want to help these people and, or, or someone, not these people, but someone sure. who constantly pushes you away and says, you know, I hate you and just leave me alone and the whole world sucks and I'm just going to well, go say, nuts here and I'm going to die soon because there's, you know, it's kind yeah. of like. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, my first suggestion would be listen. Just listen to them and let them say whatever they like and don't try to change them. People are always trying to fix. That's, that's another big problem. People are always trying to fix someone who is ill in one way. Either they're going to fix what they eat or they're going to fix the doctor they see or they're going to fix how they feel. And I think we just have to stop doing that. I think we have to have respect for people. So listening is one of the best ways to do that. Just listen to somebody. Mm -hmm. You can also, I mean, if it's a close relationship and you need to have that relationship, you can, you can ask them. I mean, this came up for me, even this Christmas, after all these years, I was on a call for caregivers and somebody said, you know, we need to ask our loved ones what would make them feel better this Christmas. And I thought, you know, I'm running around trying to make everything better. So I asked my son what would make it better. And he said, I clean house. And I thought, who would have thought? <laughs> you know, is that? I was thinking, you know, cut down the noise, change the music, you know, you know, something or other. But I think ask them, ask them what would make it better? Well, how mm -hmm. could I relate to you in a way? And uh, you know, one of the things we've done in our household is a series of, of signals. Like if it's getting to be too much, just raise your hand and I'll shut up immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll try to accommodate you because almost nobody tries to accommodate sick people. First of all, they don't believe them. Second, they think even if they do believe them, they should be behaving better. So mm -hmm. I think, I mean, personally, I think we need to listen to them and we ask them what they want and say to them, I'm happy to be here on your terms, not on my terms, but on your terms. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll have my life on my terms and you can come into it and then it's on my terms. But when I'm with you, I'm going to make it on your terms. So you just tell me what those are. Mm -hmm. That's, that's my solution. Yeah. Not everybody agree. Have you also experienced people feeling shame for, for their illness? Oh, I think that's a huge thing. I think the shame and the guilt and all of this, I don't think we realize how much people beat themselves up, how, how much I was just reading a book uh, the other day and she said about you lie there in the dark and all of this stuff comes to you all of the humiliations of your life all of the shame all of the guilt um, yes I think it's a terrible problem society um, adds to that it, it makes people feel ashamed of being you know of being old like you know mm -hmm. Heidi you're doing that conscious aging I think you know we're made to feel ashamed of who we are and and uh, illness is one of those things that people mm -hmm. tend to feel shame about, unjustifiably. Yeah. And then does it also, do you see it go in the other extreme where people become extremely needy and basically expect that everybody gives them their, their everything, yeah. so to speak? Yeah, I, it is a problem. It is a problem. And drawing those lines and finding that, that balance between caregiver and patient, for example, mm -hmm. Um, what can each party expect? Uh, and I think being communication. I have one, one of my courses on relationships and communication is enormous. You have to talk to each other. You have to figure out what's going on, what each party needs. Each party, you know, counts. The, the caregiver counts, the, the sick person counts. Whoever you're talking to, you have to be able to go to your doctor with an understanding of what your doctor needs. Your doctor needs to feel successful. Your doctor needs to be able to limit the time. And people need, have to respect that when they go in. But the doctor in turn has to respect the patient. And the mm -hmm. patient's maybe inability to speak quickly or to, you know. So there just needs to be a lot of communication, a lot of mutual respect in, in working on these relationships. Because all relationships become more difficult with mm -hmm. illness. 
whatever mm -hmm. difficulties might have been there are still there. <laughs> you know, people still have all of their personality traits. And now you've got all these extra issues on top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to step in finally and want to acknowledge there is a viewer, Angela Poriski, and she has written some comments. She said he just got here and has a question. He is beyond fatigued, barely can get out of bed. It's been at least 16 years of debilitating exhaustions. Doctors have no idea why. And then she says she's really enjoying this live chat. Thank you. Oh, mm. thank you. And I think I, I um, it sounds a lot like my son's illness, though. I really know what that's like. I mean, years and years and years in bed and unable to do things and with almost no answers. It's a, it's a terrible situation to be in. So I'm really sorry to hear that. And I'm glad mm. you're here. Yeah. And Angela, we talked about it before. I don't know if you have heard that that Lynn is beginning a course tomorrow. I think tomorrow, isn't it tomorrow? An yeah. online course for chronic illness and you might get some inspiration when you subscribe for it. Would you like to say your website again? So that they... Yes, um, the, uh, I think it's on the page below this, this uh, live stream, but um, my but website is Transformation. On... She's on YouTube, so she doesn't see it. She would oh, need okay. to go to the wisdomfactory.net slash then minus Fuentes. Then there is all the other information. But it, just repeat it. So. Yeah, well, you can go to transformationteaching.com, which is my website. And, and there's a section on that called the Cohen of Illness. And if you go to the Cohen of Illness, there's a listing of the courses and you can download the ebook and, and there's some interviews if people are interested uh, uh, um, there. So you can sign up for the fourth course, which is the one that's starting tomorrow. Um, and there are deep discounts on there because I, I don't like trying to, you know, people who are ill don't have a lot of fun. So you'll find um, deep discounts on there. And if it's not enough, you can write to me and uh, let me know. We'd love to have you. There are a lot of people on this in this course who are very severely ill and they've been, they've actually been with me for the last two or three courses and we've got a wonderful group going. So uh, anybody who'd like to join, uh, please, if you can find your way that route or you can write to me at lynn at transformationteaching.com. So I hope some of you join wonderful. us. Wonderful, that would be nice if you could give her some inspirational mm -hmm. uh, support with that. Thank you. Well, I find the other people in the group are really good at that, too. <laughs> good. Yeah, we have made almost the hour. So at this point, I would like to wrap up. We, this is our second uh, conversation, and it turned out to be completely different. And yes, I really loved it. <laughs> still, the technology was not perfect, so I still have to learn something. But it was probably better than the, the first time. So um, just to, what is the takeaway? I, I first ask uh, Martin, what is your takeaway from our conversation with Lynn? Both, let's say, both from Wednesday. Well, and from my takeaway is I, I have a few close people who have chronic illnesses and I, since I, you know, I don't consider my panic attacks a chronic illness in a way. I mean, I'm, I, I learned so much about how to more compassionately and empathetically interact with them. And, and I think it also prepared me in a way, you know, I'm 61 now of getting older and possibly having a chronic illness. And, you know, I was thinking, not only people who have a chronic illness should take your course, everybody should take your course. So we're prepared when, when it hits us, you know, so I'm really so moved and so grateful for, for your work and what I got out of these conversations. Thank That's you. my takeaway. Thank you. Yeah, and for me, it's the same thing that to find people who are so dedicated to, to help others with their knowledge, that's really, really, really great. With their knowledge, not only, but the ability. I mean, you are such a beautiful, I don't know in English the word, but yeah, compassionate person. And when I meet you, I never know you. I never have seen you. But here on, on online, I immediately feel trust. And if you 
when you can use your personality, your knowledge, your abilities to help other people to deal with their not good situations, let's say. That's, that's marvelous. I really mm -hmm. am grateful also that you came to our show and in the future we could do another one. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. It's been really nice talking with you and with Martin. And I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we hope that uh, other people will still get the information and join you in the course. And you yeah, will see you're... you're writing a book about it. So in the future, it will be all available also in the book. But I would say a course is better because people in contact with you, it's different than reading a text. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if you're you. a little late joining, that's fine too. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah.